Just a little bit about me. So my name is James Delucia. I'm with uh, Ernst & Young, so one of the big four accounting firms. Um, I have an interesting perspective. I, I lead our America certification and compliance services. So uh, technology companies that, for instance, have ISO certificates, such as uh, like, like Google and Amazon and Rackspace and uh, those, those types of organizations. I oversee all that work, so it's, it's been interesting to try to adjust you know, our control programs to you know, these technology organizations. Um, yeah, I had the pleasure of, of writing and I tinker a bit in a kind of recovering coder. Um, so the way I've broken out this presentation is to be very specific on, on kind of facts, on what, what we see in an audit side to kind of share some of the audit progression that happens so that you kind of understand you know, how you can insert yourself into the process and you know, make your, your, your environments kind of maybe not, not conform to the audit, but maybe communicate and, and weave together better than before. So with that being said, you know, I will kind of talk about audit speak a little bit. And so the, my attempt will be to share some of the, the, the phraseology that, that we use on the audit side so that as you're um, a participant and not a victim of that process, perhaps you'll be able to um, better represent what's happening in the organization. And so when we go through this, if at any point, if something is a bit vague or it seems, uh, I guess, too legal, you know, please just kind of stand up and, and wave and I'll, and I'll try to dive in a little bit more specific. You know, my intent was to provide a format, kind of the, the present as to you know, industry, business management and the requirements, you know, kind of speak about hypothetical non-existent situations that, that may or may not apply. And then of course, you know, have an analogies and translations as possible within the audit side and then kind of progress through there, through um, some, some key indicators so that when you're looking at your organization, how, does, how that organization could look better uh, from an audit perspective and then how it could perform and continuously improve. Um, you'll, you'll find my hope is that this topic, it does not really steer us to you know, how to just get by but through the audits, but perhaps I mean, how we can evolve you know, our programs to continuously evolve better um, you know, in that side. And I'm a little biased. I come from the security side, and you know, we have things you know, like the ISO standards where we talk about continuous improvement. And so I'm really going to try to advocate that flow through here. Um, so right out of the box, um, when you think about audits, you have to think of it as, as assurance. And so it's very particular. If you've ever tried to engage uh, an audit organization uh, like, like, a, like an EY or another big four or another county. You know, we're very particular in, in how we present the information that we execute and then what those reports are used for. And, and the reason is, uh, if you've kind of seen the news over the last, you know, last few weeks or even the last 10 years, you've noticed you know, big four accounting firms that issue opinions that don't always line up to reality, you know, either go out of business or you know, people kind of lose their homes and houses as a result because they are directly personally liable for those statements that they made about the organization. So assurance is where our businesses are trying to form partnerships with other organizations, right? And so if you, you are, you're running a grocery chain and you're trying to do business, you want to have trust with your suppliers. If you are running a technology platform, you are trying to have trust in that the people that are providing you maybe the power and pipe at the physical layer are doing that at a certain level of competency and consistency so you can meet your customers' requirements. Um, and so when you think about you know, the trust between the parties, you have to think, what is everybody asking of each other? And so when it comes to audit, that's primarily what we're aiming to, to solve, is if you are um, looking at the, the public markets, you know, they are looking for financial integrity. They're looking to have absolute confidence that the numbers that they're being presented and trading on at that moment are whole and accurate. And, and so that's why you see things like SOX and the SEC issuing guidance as to how that should be done. When you work with your partners to do business, you, um, you have to worry about the trust in the delivery of the materials, the, the consistency of the services. And to give an example, a very specific example, if you were working with a partner who's providing you just-in-time equipment, and so maybe you are a cloud provider and you're, you're receiving goods or you are a manufacturer. It, it really works in both scenarios. It's better than manufacturing, but this client in particular had a supply chain risk where they were producing at a just-in-time level and they were asking for assurance from their vendors. And when they were asking for assurance, they wanted to know that the operations would be consistent, that they had security and controls in place and the, such things. 
And the reason they needed that is that prior to that date, they had a supplier who was attacked by a competitor who modified their shipping manifests so that our business received product and didn't receive product when it was supposed to and failed to meet our client deliveries. And so if you think about it, if you are making a car and you rely on brakes from a vendor, the attack hit the brake provider and the brake provider's shipping manifests were modified by the attacker so they were not sending us enough brake pads to build their cars. And so it was a very interesting attack structure and it led to a much more sophisticated supply chain uh, risk program. But when it comes to assurance, it is how do you trust the third parties and what are you representing in those reports? So you have to realize is that when you are a part of an audit, there are particular tasks that are being sought out in order to present that information to those third parties. So really think about it at that level. And I try to, you know, it's really OAuth for business, right? So how do I know I'm really handling it? How can I pass the tokens and how can I trust that that's the correct information and the information that I'm sharing at that time? So really think about the role of assurance and how it meets your business. The type of audits can vary. Like within an organization, you'll audit yourself, right? That's continuous improvement. Uh, that will allow you to have you know integrity of the books. It allows you know for uh, for programs to be you know to mature, um, and also it allows for people for management to understand what's really happening, right? Because if all the lights are on, does that mean it's all working, right? And you would say, well, just because the, the the lights are on doesn't mean it's working. We we have other ways of measuring that. And so as you go through the organization, you see that statutory, regulatory items come into play. Scope and bounds is very important. So when you deal with financial reporting, you have to deal with the financial integrity of the systems, what's contributing to those systems in order to determine transactions. So it's very explicit, it's very specific hardware, specific systems, specific people. When you work on you know, internal and external audits, you know, third parties, when they're you know, shipping manifests and product quality and all those things, those all come together. The recipient of the report is very important, number one, to the auditor, right? Because we have to conform to certain you know, public requirements. And the reason I say it that way is when we put reports together, those reports have to match a quality standard. And then we are audited nonstop by the quality uh, boards to review our papers, our decisions, how they came to bear. And I actually included some of the, the observations that later on in this presentation to share with you um, to, to show the rigor and the adaptions and the, uh, the adaptations that our programs take as a result of that feedback, uh, because it directly affects organizations as yourselves and ours and how we represent other organizations. Um, so each type of audit has a unique concern, and I, I say a right, and it's a right as in, you know, if you're for representing the security or uh, privacy of your organization, it's presented in that information. So, so really focus on the type of audits and how it fits your organization. Um, when you think about the pieces coming together, though, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on what side of the coin you're looking at, um, auto report trends, you know, it's shifting. So when you work with organizations, we, we've done a couple surveys, to, you know, and we found that three-fourths of organizations see an increased request of, of reports. So different types of reports, different integrities that are happening. And the bottom stat here is actually very scary. 45% of the existing auto reports do not satisfy the objectives of the person requesting it. So think about that for a moment. You work very hard, you put together your control programs, you represent the evidence. You know, somebody comes in, puts their name on it, pushes a report out, and 45% of the time, it doesn't satisfy the objectives. That is, that, that, you know, that, that needs to shift as far as an operational change. And what's interesting is that there's another stat that we found out when we did the survey um, is that it's on average 40 hours per response time. For, for, per third party asking you for a question over, hey, can you represent how you have security? Or hey, can you represent that my data is safe or secure or integrity is there or I can trust this partnership? Average is 40 hours minimum. So that, and I say average minimum, is when you take, you know, you did the stats out, 40 hours is the lowest amount that on average we saw people having to reply to it. And it's usually folks like yourself, people in, in the operations and in leadership positions that are responsible for building those systems. And so it's a very, it's a big hit to the operation. We are seeing regulations and quality standards improve to catch up. Um, as technology improves, we're seeing things come out more clearly. And we'll, again, we'll talk about a couple of those uh, near the end. But as the standards are evolving to reflect, for instance, if you 
are familiar with ISO 27001, which is a security management program, uh, they just released a new version in the end of September. Otherwise, it was eight years in, in unchanged. So from 2005 to now, the standard hadn't changed. And so you know, we didn't have iPhones, we didn't have Facebook, we didn't have half the technology we have in this room. Uh, so think about the, the magnitude of shift that's happened. Uh, supply chain has become much more important. Uh, online applications have been, well, you weren't even called out in the old standards. So it's very interesting to think how we, how we fit those together. And so why are the auditors asking for these things? Well, the birth of the audit requirements, I, I kind of, I try to be a little coy here a little bit, but the, the idea is that regulations and other state risks and concerns, and then they draw up control objectives. So when you are looking at your organization, there are control objectives and then procedures. Control objectives are, you know, thou shalt do good, right? And then, well, how are you going to do that, right? And then there's going to be subparts behind that. The control objectives are very important because that is what you will use when you're trying to communicate to the business as to how your, what's called, is, is, you know, your continuous improved and continuously deploying op op operations fit into this model. So when you're being audited, you need to think about it from that level. To be more specific, yeah. Yes, Gene. Testing. All right. One of the reasons why we're so excited about this uh, presentation is that nothing freaks auditors more out than seeing developers do their own deploys, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, in the absence of change management approval processes, separation of duties. And so, um, James is a practicing auditor, and we've asked him to actually establish from first principles not only why audit, but then go through risks to control objectives and controls, and actually show how does what an organization show that they have a control environment, they can prevent bad things from happening, if they can't prevent, at least be able to detect and correct. And how do you evidence that so that you can show that to another auditor and have them, like James, be able to say, yeah, that's perfect, that's what I was asking for. So this is um, the reason for the uh, first principles uh, discussion. So thank you, James, sorry to interrupt. No, no, it's good. It's actually allowed me for a technical difficulty, so. Oh, I see, yeah, that's technical. Let's give this a moment, shall we? There we go. But, but, yeah, good, clear, beautiful. Yeah, no? Yeah. That's kind of interesting. Yeah, all right, fonts, good, beautiful. So uh, separation of duties and development testing of operational environments. So the control objectives here are further elaborated out. Development tests and operations should be separated. All right, but what does it mean for you? And so, you know, I have to say this is for you to decide. And one thing we have to understand is that from an auditor's perspective, I'm auditing what management feels is absolutely required, right? And so the, the control objective that's designed here you know, is unique. The procedures are put in place to document that control. So that is what the auditor is looking for. And so what I'm trying to show here is the linkage of how it impacts your organization. So when you sit there and you're being audited, they say, hey, I need to see all the access logs you know, for, you know, for your con control code. And I need to see that all the pushes are happening by people approved and change control happening every time. What they're really asking is that, help me understand this linkage and how does it fit in your business? And so when you look at it from this level, you, you design the control objective, the procedures say we're gonna, you, developers are not gonna deploy code, or they are gonna deploy code, but they're gonna do it in this manner. Um, and then this is what the auditor needs in order to represent it. Because remember, when we're putting together these reports, we're trying to say everything is working the way you say it's working, right? Think of it that way. Um, so what do the auditors need? They need demonstrative evidence that it's satisfied in a statistically relevant level. So think of it this way. When you have to show evidence, it, it needs to be something that you can, you know, preferably not print out 300 pages of code, which has happened, which is a, a, it's a really fulfilling experience. Um, didn't work, but it was really fulfilling. Um, think about how you're representing that you are satisfying it and providing clarity to the operations. And a statistically relevant level, you have to understand is that um, when we decide on what evidence it's the based on the population and the sample rate. If there are errors in the sample rate, then we have to ask for more evidence, right? And so it's a published standard. It's, there's, there's no magic behind it. We have to all follow the same rules. So when you're in, in an audit, if they say, well, I need five, five pieces of evidence, great. Five, what's the population you're working from? Work with them to understand and get that visibility because there's, there's no secrets and there's, no, there's nothing, no hidden agendas during the audits. You can ask the questions the other way and say, what was your population? Why did you choose this sample? Because hopefully you'll come back and say, 
That doesn't make any sense. You're, com you're not even checking the control the way it should be checked. And then the auditor is like, fantastic, help me test this correctly so there's no downwind problem. Because if you think about it, if we give them the wrong evidence and it gets all the way to the end of the report and then somebody in management says, that doesn't make any sense, I disagree with those findings, then we start the cycle over again, right? And it's, it's kind of like a death spiral of pain. And we, we can get out of it just by being more clear and kind of go back to the communication. So I want to just kind of spoke up. Yeah, please. Yeah. So, so James, in, in that last example yeah. uh, with the separation of concerns, are you saying that um, as a client running a service, mm -hmm. um, uh, we are able to say, okay, out of um, so many hundreds or thousands of deploys to so many customers, um, they follow, that's your, your denominator for the statistical base. And um, uh, here are the logs of what happened during those things mm -hmm. where these procedures were followed. And um, you know, here are, the, here are the greens and here are the reds. Correct, yes. And we can provide that evidence to the auditor and say, so this is the demonstration that we are in compliance of the control objective? You're gonna put me right in the box right away, aren't you? I like that. That's, that's it. <laughs> um, so, so, let's, so I, I, any good person would say, well, it depends, right? And that's, that's completely unhelpful. So the answer is, in certain scenarios, it's that easy, okay? And so I would draw a couple and, you know, I like to say, well, it depends, but here are the variables that make it depend. Um, it depends on the types of, of pushes we're speaking about. Um, and I have one slide I'll, we'll, we'll get to. It'll be a nice review when we get there. But specifically, it says, usually I see people tear out the type of deploys and where you will come back and say, well, yeah, we do hundreds of thousands of deploys you know, throughout a year, but 80% of them are minor tweaks. And so, therefore, here is that population. And then 10% of this, 5% is this, 2 and 3%. And so the idea, what you would present and say the total population of what matters to this scope, right, for this control objective is 1,000, or it's 500, or it's 20, right? It may be very minor. And so the answer is yes, you can represent, here's the total population, here's how we rolled it out, and here are the controls that we put, in, here, you know, here are the control procedures as it relates to that control objective to satisfy it. So I want to say yes, but I think there's some variables we have to be mindful of because I think everybody's organization might be slightly different. You want to help? So just to rephrase, you're saying one is an argument of, is this a statistically relevant population? Yes. Right. Yeah. That's what you're saying. And the second is, once you identify the population, then you sample, what is a statistically relevant sample size? Yeah. The sample assurance. size is actually a very specific formula that you know, we're bound by. So that's a that's, that's much easier question. It's the first, what is, the, what is the population? And I would advise tiering out the populations so that you're not... You know, for instance, you know, you know, looking at stuff that's just, oh, we just updated a, a piece of content or a small push that wasn't production effective. Maybe the session should have been called Ask an Auditor Anything. <laughs> all right. That's Sorry. between uh, six and seven. Um, all right, so let's talk about trains. I try to, again, put down some analogies here. Um, We're getting lost in uh, jargon. I would say just pipe up and uh, please, it's yes. probably the fastest way to route, fastest way to get to the desired outcomes. Yeah, that's, that, yeah, that is ideal. So jumping right in, again, I, I talk pretty fast because I want to try to give you guys as much content as possible. And since we're going to make the content available, it's, uh, it should be ideal. So key activities, uh, coming down the tracks. So if you had to train, we have three different scenarios. Um, we talked about the control objectives, the procedures, and the audit activities as a result. But the risk assessments and the threats and vulnerabilities are very important. So think about your organization and how you quantify risk. What matters for you on a risk basis. And so the risk assessments help design the security program and the compliance program together. And risk assessments are very important. So a lot of organizations have a much larger risk program, and then they have sub-risk programs to evaluate you know, kind of tactical areas. And it's important, I'll draw this for two points. One, it's, it's very leading practice, and it's, it's very in tune to not over-auditing and not over you know, putting safeguards in place that are unnecessary. But secondly, it actually aligns up to some recent audit guidance that just came out that speaks directly to auditors practicing this approach with you. And so that way you're not being, you know, I like to say kind of getting you know, audit fatigue because people are asking questions that 
are unnecessary. So my, my, uh, when the train is coming down the tracks, meaning you've got a bit of runway, it's not audit season, it's not busy season, you guys can reach out to the internal audit department, you can reach out to the security group, you can work with management, identify what are the risks that the business is trying to address at the program and the audit level. You have to understand that the audit plans are built a year in advance. So we're talking about the poise, you know, how fast it is and how much better if it's smaller chunks and we go faster and it's lower cost and it's more efficient. Audit programs have to be built a year in advance. So when they, they're already having it planned out based off last year's risk and they're coming to see you. So that's already too late. So you really want to plan this a year in advance of really trying to reach out to them, understand what the control objectives are and what risks do they assign. Because again, business decides what are the control objectives to the procedures. So if you can become part of that process, the procedures that they're asking you to execute against are in line with your own business and your own responsive development structures. So really think of it that way. So if the train's already left the station, you know, now we have to, to, to worry about things that are, are approaching us at this moment. And so I like to say, so I wrote up here as a team, see you've got the regulatory and common control objectives that are, you know, we're managing against. And so, I think the last slide had it maybe? Yeah. So a common control objectives would be if you have PCI, HIPAA, BISMA, FedRAMP, and all these other access control, you know, uh, segregation of, of environments, there's some consistency. And so usually your, your departments will have that pre-built, and so you don't need to try to manage against seven different standards internally on the development side. You should be able to reach out to those teams and say, what is the consolidated requirement you need me to achieve in the scope and bounds? And now what you're dealing with one, let them come bring, the, bring to bear the legal and, and the, the audit experience to say, here are the seven we need to do because we're in these seven markets and strategically we're gonna go in this and expand globally. So we're, yeah. All those factors should already be considered by this point. So you should be able to reach out to them and say, I need a consolidated scope and bound of what we care about so I can make sure our deploy environments fit that structure. So it's really careful to think about that. And then when you start thinking about uh, I talk about here procedures on already committed and developed the translation of those procedures to your environment, meaning that if we have already, we're already baked the procedures saying we will represent our control environment by these 17 things. Work with internally to draw up how you're going to reflect those and have management sign them off. What you've already done by doing that is now you have visibility across and so when there is an audit, they'll say, well, how do we know that this was, was okay when they, we come back and we come up with these findings? Well, management review will say, we reviewed that. Like, we already reviewed that. We understand that that was a variance, and we've already addressed that. And so that's a very positive effect for the business. Gene. So can you give us some examples of what those 17 control objectives might sound like? So that would, um, you know, access control, um, you, know, you know, management signed off, you know, things are finalized, things are published. Um, control objectives, if you were in the government space, it would be 853A. Uh, Please. Oh, you, you, you did. By the way, my five minute warning, so we're going to talk faster if that's even possible. Um, so I'll come back to, uh, on the break on, uh, to, on that question. So finally, during the audit, it's not possible to change the audit control procedures, and it's very important that you focus on representing as carefully as you can without creating a negative event during an audit. Now, that doesn't mean come up with fake evidence. That means just be very specific as to what you're responding to, and no more, no less. But the idea here is the audit, you want to be a success with a high quality and just avoid any negative impacts. Negative impacts would be misrepresenting the, the control environment that then requires you know, suddenly an SSC filing that we can't issue a, an audit report, right? Because we, the control environment wasn't, wasn't, wasn't correctly audited, right? We don't, that's a negative event, right? That's a, that's a lot of noise we don't need to mark. Even if it's a great environment, it doesn't change. It's still a negative event. So really focus on that. Uh, I'm gonna jump to the challenging environments. So, so factor fiction, utilize the audit as part of your continuous improvement. Um, I always say you should require the audit to come back to you with feedback as to what could be improved on operational improvements on the control procedures. After the audit, completely valid to request that. And it's, it's very much in line with kind of the risk assessment approach that's expected. I'm actually going to probably do slide 30 seconds and then we can have a Q&A and we can go back. Um, change management, preventive versus detective controls. Uh, tier out your changes. So based on what? Based on your organization. So if it's 
only up, if we're doing dev pushes and it's real minor, it's not going to affect certain broader systems, that's one category. Maybe it doesn't require any sign-offs. Maybe there's very limited automated testing. As you tear up into the larger areas, I had the privilege of speaking with a lot of individuals in the last 24 hours about how they roll this tech out. And everybody has automated testing and automated checks within the system. Even though they're pushing it directly to production, there's almost this magic middle system that's handling that negotiation and the risk in the canary scenario. So it's important to communicate that while dev is pushing to production, there is this intelligence in the middle that you've built. And you have to take credit for that because otherwise people just think, so you're literally just pushing it to production. No, obviously not. No, I would never do that. So you have to help with that, that concept. So change management, visibility, and then how would you change an organization from, from two week change to two hour change has to do with that automated integration. Separation of duties, it is possible to have both worlds where you have separation and you know, do high, high throughput. Um, we, we had a great example this morning with Netflix where they talked about multi-level accounts and monitoring. Um, or you need a wicked good application in the middle to act as the promoter, which is what I was just referring to moments ago. I also want to highlight that a lot of the standards don't require separation of duties. So just be, again, get in front of the train. You know, why are you asking for separation of duties? Rationalize that and close that out. All right, so just three more, to, two more to go. I know we got the clock ticking in the back. Uh, PCA will be updated the 10, on 1024 as it relates to financial reporting systems. I put this in here for, for your review later on. Risk assessments and the monitoring controls and the determination of the control procedures is what they actually advised that based on reviews of public accounting audits, this is what should change in our audits. How do they ex expect that? They, ex they want to try to make sure that we can test across a location and extrapolate that they're designed and implemented consistently across all the locations. So think about your systems and this statement. Electronically, how you're deploying it across large dispersed environments, this statement applies directly to you and this is how you would translate these high deployment environments and these cloud and abstracted systems You're using the, the puppet labs and the other scenarios and te technologies we have in place. So really keep an eye on that. And then finally, what is a clean auditable world? Like what, what will you do to help the auditor? and help yourself. Clarity, a lot of times, some of the stuff just doesn't make sense, right? Sometimes you are working at a light speed that some people just don't quite grasp and they want to walk in some place and see a wall of servers, right? Don't walk them into a room of wall servers and then say, oh, we also have a thousand someplace else in the, in the cloud, because that, that's confusing. We can give clarity, 100% awareness. You're, an auditor is trying to gain comfort that you are doing exactly what you need to do for that time period. Right? And so if you can confidently say, well, here are all the deploys we do, here are all the people involved, here is how we monitor it, we have very little preventive controls except for this amazing intelligence in the middle, um, and this is how we have confidence it's all working based off of, of, the, of, this, of this trending, that is what they need. They need awareness that you can bring those pieces together and help line up the linkages to the risks in your own program. Um, multiple competencies are usually involved, uh, re re reproducible, so that if you, this year, present something and the next year, present something different, last year's results are looked at, right? You review the stuff every year, so we have to review it too. So if something has changed year over year, that's a really big problem, especially if the facts go like this, okay? So be very clear, reproducible on how you put things together, and then comparable, and I put in integrity and validity. Nobody's challenging the evidence, is, is, has integrity to it, but sometimes it's, it doesn't measure up to, to what you're doing totally. And so that's sometimes either communication with the audit program to the, the findings or just how the evidence was presented in the scope and bounds. So that's it at a very rapid pace. Well, I'll do questions afterwards. I know we're out of time. Um, but thank you very much for your time.